Ten seconds. I'd like to call tonight's Summers of Planning Board meeting to order. Anna, please call the roll. Chris Horton. Here. Jeremy Rhodes. Here. Paul Rabitis. Here. Ron LaHoulier. Here. Robert Belmore. Here. David Witham. Here. Jason Berry. Here. Mark Richardson. Here. Item one, approval of the minutes of June 25, 2024. Regular meeting minutes. Anybody have a motion? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Berry. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Abstain? Next item is committee reports. We have a summary of the land use board reports. Are there any comments? Comments. Mr. Horton. I think it's appropriate to probably highlight one of the um, approvals that was received during the SRTC, but 40 Main Street was approved. Uh, it's been a discussion uh, lately before this board, um, but it was approved for retail, so glad to see that moving forward. That's all I got. Thanks. Any other comments? City Council report. Mr. Witham. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I want to bring to light uh, some work that's been done uh, with the Mayor's Housing Task Force. As you know, Mayor Girding uh, put together an ad hoc committee to look at uh, housing needs in the city uh, and what we can do from uh, a number of different perspectives. Uh, we're looking at our, our, our zoning. We're going to have a land use regulation audit tonight. Uh, that That's relative. But at our most recent meeting, we talked at length about uh, growing the number of multifamily units in the urban core, uh, which on its face seems very logical. There are a lot of properties that perhaps could support that. But like any decision, there are always uh, other effects of those decisions, uh, not the least of which is parking. Most of the properties that might avail themselves to a greater number of housing units within the current property uh, are by and large houses that take up almost all of the parcel or there is a very small driveway uh, associated with the parcel. So when you go to uh, a greater number of units, uh, there obviously is a need for more parking and how do you handle that? The most logical approach is to support on-street parking. Um, and I think generally speaking, the Mayor's Housing Task Force supports the idea of uh, allowing for a greater use of on-street parking. But yet another effect of that is what do we do in the wintertime when there is a snow emergency declared? And we've dealt with that with other applicants before. Uh, so the task force asked that um, the City Council, in particular the Public Works and Environment Committee, look at uh, some uh, options there. And uh, we did that just yesterday. And, and although very early and still requires uh, much more vetting out, uh, there's at least a notion to look at uh, allowing on-street parking during snow emergencies on Main Street. It's a wide street. Uh, public works could plow the travel way. And then when the snow emergency is lifted and people can return to their uh, normal parking pattern, uh, public works could then clean up uh, that area on Main Street. Right now we have two small areas that we dedicate for winter snow emergency parking one up by the Noble Pines playground and one by the Jules Bison playground. And I think uh, in some total it's like 18 spots. Uh, obviously Main Street we could get well into the 30, 40, 50 range uh, with, with ease. Uh, so uh, we're looking at that option. Uh, again, a lot more detail to come, but that's at least sort of percolating in the background. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Witham. Stratford Regional Planning Commission update, SRPC, Mr. Uh, Richardson. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, I was not able to meet the meeting on Monday. Uh, it was a combined meeting of uh, the MPO and the, uh, and the TAC committees. So uh, I was in Maine, and I don't have an update for that meeting at this moment. All right, thank you. Mr. Horton, do you have anything to add? Thank you. Eyes on 30 to 2030 committee, Mr. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there was a meeting held on Monday. Regretfully, I was not able to participate. So next month, I'll bring in a full report. Thank you. Community Power Coalition, Mr. No, Horton. No report. And Housing Committee, Mr. Horton. Covered by Councilor Witham. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on, item three, old business. Item A, continued from May 15, 2024, Bill Doobie Kia LLC is seeking site plan approval for an automobiles sales and services facility on a property located at 220 and 222 yeah. Route 108 in the commercial industrial CI district assesses map 61, lots 10 and 11, site number 02-2024. Director Mayor, is there anything to add this evening? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At the June 25th meeting, the applicant submitted a request to continue their application to this meeting to allow for an updated drainage analysis in response to third-party review comments. Applicant has been working with staff in Horsley Witten to review and discuss the drainage plan. Uh, the applicant has submitted updated drainage and site plans. They have reduced the overall pavement on the site and removed 10 uh, parking spaces and increased the bioretention area size. At the May 15th planning board meeting, uh, accepted the application as complete, determined the project did not have the potential for regional impact and continue the application to the June meeting. Applicant has submitted a response to third party comments, updated plan set and revised drainage analysis. The updated plan set includes changes to the landscaping plan. That's it. Uh, thank you. Before we get started with the uh, rest meeting, anybody that cares to speak this evening, please come up to the podium and state your name and address or your affiliation and please address the board. Uh, if you need to stray from the podium, take a portable mic with you because it is being uh, recorded on television so people at home can hear you. Uh, so before we move on, is there a motion to continue this item to this meeting? So moved. Motion made by Mr. Robitus. Second. Second by Mr. Witham. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Bill Dupi Kia to make that presentation. Hi, good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. For the record, Doug Remore with Jewett Construction, representing the applicant. Uh, with me tonight, Eric Sari from Altus Engineering, uh, Henry Hess with Sebago Technics, and Dan Ray also with Jewett Construction. Uh, the Doobies are unfortunately out of town tonight uh, on a previous commitment, but they do send their best to the board. Um, it's good to be before you guys all again. Uh, we feel like we're in a really good spot with the project at this point. Um, in your packets, there should be a final letter from Horsley Witten Group uh, dated 716, uh, which states that Horsley Witten is satisfied and the applicant has addressed all of the previous comments um, in their letters. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've worked with Horsley Witten as well as staff. Uh, to get to the design to what we feel is a really comfortable point. Uh, we're grateful to both Horsley Witten and the town for the continued interest and cooperation through these past few weeks and we hope throughout the project. Um, I know there's quite a few items behind us on the before the board tonight, um, so I'll, I'll leave it to that. Uh, we appreciate the board would consider uh, approval on our waivers and the overall uh, site plan application tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Open a public hearing. Does anybody care to comment on this application? Director Mears, is there any uh, correspondence concerning this application? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none, close public hearing. Turn to questions from the board. Mr. Witham. Yeah, I guess this is a question for my fellow board members first. Um, this applicant is seeking uh, a number of waivers. I'm not quite sure we've ever had an application in front of us with this many waiver requests. Not that that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a thing. Uh, but were those vetted out in any detail at the prior meeting? Mr. Horton? Um, I'll just, uh, to respond to that, I think a lot of them had to do with parking and stuff like that. We did talk through them. We did discuss landscaping, um, so I believe in previous meetings we have addressed many, if not all. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Yes. Uh, I'll address the applicant with a couple that uh, I, I would just like to uh, vet out a little bit further for my uh, personal satisfaction. 
There's a waiver request about the shielding of rooftop HVAC units. Sure. Uh, why is that uh, not possible? So uh, the existing parapet that is proposed around the building does sufficiently shield uh, the rooftop units. The, the difference with adding additional shielding to the rooftop is it presents quite a large, uh, probably pretty close to a six figure cost, uh, there's structural engineering involved to wrap um, the, the shielding around all those units. And uh, with the, the design, and I believe there's a perspective view in your packet from probably a previous hearing um, that shows that the parapet that we're calling for um, as part of the design itself shields adequately um, those rooftop units without dedicated shielding. Okay, so understood. So from a, a street level view, and, 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 and typically these uh, uh, diagrams show like a six foot high person or something like that looking from the street level, uh, the units are largely shielded by the parapet but not fully shielded. Is that what I'm understanding here? Yeah, based, based on our perspective we've submitted, they're 95 plus percent shielded okay. um, from every perspective. Yeah. All right, so, so the, just a portion that you might be able to see if you're sitting in a car, maybe not even. So you wouldn't even notice it driving by. Not that I want people looking for those as they drive by. Right, they're focused on the road. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there's a uh, you're seeing a waiver from uh, the requirement to put in a sidewalk. This has been very typical in the Route 108 corridor with any number of other applicants through that corridor. It makes complete sense where we're looking in the not too distant future at a, a complete streets upgrade of that um, uh, uh, with the oversight of New Hampshire DOT. Uh, that being said, we've had a number of other uh, projects along that corridor that have calculated the cost of what it would cost to construct a, a sidewalk and we've arrived at a contribution uh, to the city uh, that we would put into a dedicated fund ultimately for the purchase of a sidewalk tractor because uh, we know that once the sidewalk on Route 108 gets built uh, that uh, we need to add another sidewalk tractor to our fleet for that maintenance. Uh, as you're probably well aware, sidewalk tractors are a quarter million dollars, so we're trying to nest egg the money to uh, be prepared for that. So. Uh, at some point tonight, and I don't need an answer right off the cuff, but I'd be wondering if the applicant be willing for some sort of contribution towards that uh, end uh, with regard to that waiver. Has that calculation been determined? Uh, I don't know. Uh, where this is pretty typical along that corridor, um, you know, I, I can't say that we require it at the outset, but maybe that's something that if the applicant is amenable to some sort of contribution and typically it's not been the full amount of the sidewalk it's been some number less than that that we've agreed to uh, if we're looking for approval tonight i'd be amenable to a condition that uh, a cost of the sidewalk would be calculated and uh, maybe we'd look at a contribution of 50 percent of that cost or something like that if that was amenable to the applicant and then uh, uh, lastly, let's just talk about uh, site lighting. I do appreciate that there were two plan sets, one for uh, lighting when the business is open and one for after hours. And sure. I can very much appreciate the need for site lighting to uh, maintain site security, which I think is the need. Uh, however, as you're well aware, we are very, very close to a residential neighborhood there. Um, and I think even though there's diminished site lighting, uh, I think it could still generate some concerns, particularly from those that are immediate abutters there. What, did the applicant give any thought to uh, motion sensing on any of the light poles, particularly the ones closest? Uh, I know in the past with older light fixtures, it was too slow to come on, but with LED, it can be mm -hmm. instant. So is that an option that we could explore? Uh you're talking specific to the the lighting that would be in like the rear of the site yeah yeah i'm looking at the ones like on the back of the building uh, you know there's right uh, f three four five sconces uh, along the back of the building there yep. it, could those be on motion sensors just because after of hours that? yeah yeah um I, I would say that's probably something that we'd be amenable to um the you know the sensors and all those all those lights are pretty easily programmable um and as long as they were like you said kind of instant on um, that would be the idea, although I will say that um, we feel that you know, the existing photometrics that we've shown do adequately uh, protect the property line 
as well as the fact that there is a, a fence in the back mm -hmm. um, with plantings. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Mr. Horton. Uh, I'll just comment that uh, I appreciate all the work you guys done to uh, in, uh, incorporate and revise uh, all the comments received from a third party review. So uh, I have I have no additional uh, comments or concerns at this time. So appreciate it. Mr. Richardson. Yeah, thank you. Um, as you know, when this was first presented to us, having 18 waivers, I couldn't comprehend that. We've never seen anything like that at all, and I still have problems with it, and I'm still struggling with the way I'm going to vote for this. Um, I am glad to see that you work things out on the uh, drainage aspect, and I'm, I'm satisfied with all of that part of it. There's another, I mean, to me, I look at this as with this number of waivers and for the different reasons and the lighting being another one of them, especially, I'm looking at a square peg that's trying to be fit into a round hole for the lot size. And it doesn't fit. And therefore, we have all of these waiver requests and the drainage issues that have been raised. And that's, that's troubling to me. It really is. Um, I have gone back and forth in this many times. But one thing that, another thing that really did bother me, and this isn't just true in your case, and we've heard it before, because of our corporate style and regulations, we have to have things this big, this big, and this big. And that's telling a town or a city like ours to heck with your rules and regulations. We're doing it the way we want to. That bothers me. Bothers me a lot. If that, I mean, that could be the killer here for me, to be honest with you. Um, I just, I don't get that. That's, that's really being disrespectful to any community. And again, this is the first time I've said something about it because I think in, in, in uh, you know, the original plans that we received and everything that was mentioned four times that we're required, our showroom is supposed to be so big. And that means there's no flexibility there w with uh, uh, setbacks. That means there's no flexibility uh, with the, you know, such things as the lighting in the back and things like that. And that's a problem to me. Um, I just want you to know that. I'm, I'm going to listen to what everybody has to say tonight. And tonight's, you know, I'll make up my mind which way. If I vote no, it, I'm certainly going to be in the, more, in the minority because I really want this project to go through. I mean, right now, I, I believe people uh, <coughs> with Kias have to go to Hampton if they want service by a Kilo deal. De dealership and it's a very popular vehicle so I you know for that reason alone you know I'm, I'm sitting there jumping up and down going this is a great plan but it's the other stuff that just is for me it's really hard so I just want you to know that so yeah okay a absolutely appreciate mm -hmm. the opinions um, we understand that there's you know there's limitations that are placed on us and therefore then placed on you um, and I would just note uh, with what flexibility we have in terms of how big the building is, we're at about as small as we can go. Um, we're not pushing the envelope in terms of making it bigger um, than um, is absolutely necessary. Um, there's certain, certain dimensions, mostly with the shop, that kind of have to be what they are in any, in any dealership. Uh, but of course, I, I do understand where you're coming from, um, from your perspective, um, or kind of put it, mentioning the manufacturer a lot, as you said. Um, the other thing I'll add, just in terms of the number of waivers, is, uh, and I believe we've mentioned this, but um, for what it's worth, a um, handful of them, as you stated, have to do with um, the New England architectural standards. Um, the other, large chunk of them have to do uh, with the uh, reduction in frontage or in um, the amount of site that we have due to the DOT project, which I know we've said a lot of times, but is still very much true. Um, a lot of those uh, buffer requirements and the like are pretty directly uh, linked to that, and we didn't have near as many before this project was, or the DOT project was brought to our attention. Um, so, just wanted to note that although I understand that there's a lot of waivers in front of the board, 
um, the number doesn't necessarily represent um, the significance of the ask. But I appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Mr. Robitus. Uh, a couple things real quick. I, I don't want to keep repeating, um, you know, a million comments. The um, Horsley Witten report, I reviewed that twice today when that was sent to us. Um, thank you for basically complying with the request of the um, uh, their group. Um, that's pretty important to me. I think two things that I'd like to comment on, not looking for a specific response, I guess, but uh, Councilman Witham brought up the lighting. That is a really tight neighborhood in the back there, and I think sure. it's only fair to those people um, that purchased housing out there that this business was not there, that there's some light protection from light pollution. So I can't imagine it's, gonna, it's a big lift to put in um, motion sensor lights there. And the last comment that I have is the height of the parapet. I know that another dealership that we dealt with on 108, we um, spent a fairly significant amount of time dealing with the height of that parapet, hiding uh, HVAC units, and you can see them. You can see them coming both directions, and um, I just want to make sure that we don't have a repeat of that um, with your project. Other than that, thank you for bringing the project to the city. It's a good project. It's going to clean that lot up, sure. um, and I think it's um, you know important for the community. So that's all I have. Mr. Rhodes. Thank you. Uh, so a couple points that I wanted to address here. Um, some of them spin off of uh, what Mr. Richardson raised. Um, wanted to also address a couple that I saw in the plans as I was going through them. Uh, first piece, I think you've done everything that could be hoped for within the realm of reason to improve the drainage on the property. The initial plan uh, was, I think many of us would agree, a little rough. Um, the state you're in now is vastly improved. Um, and I wanted to note that specifically. In addition, um, I made a comment at the last session that the landscaping plan had been scaled back and I had think that the majority of us believe that the original one was uh, considerably better. I think you've drifted back towards that better destination and very happy to see that as well. I think you've also included a lot of natives um, and in the cases where you haven't, it's because you need something quick growing to act as that shield between your property and the residential neighborhood behind it. Looking at the state of this in this lot, in this entire 108 corridor, you are shoved to the back of the lot by DOT work that we don't have a full definition on at this point. And I think if we as a board want to make sure, certain that we have a minimized number of waivers, we're talking about putting the 108 corridor effectively into stasis until the DOT figures out what they're doing. As we've seen for over two years now, that's a fool's errand. They, they don't know, or they aren't at least sharing what they're doing with that corridor. The number of waivers, I think, are driven in large part by that. And my inclination is when faced with inactivity that would cause inactivity to adapt. And I think that's what we're doing here. So I am a little bit concerned about the number of waivers. I think you've been forced into them. And if we weren't to grant them at this point, we'd be talking about saying that this property is not developable until the DOT figures out what they're going to do. Um, the other piece I wanted to address was around the appearance standards and the fact that so many of these are getting imposed by corporate entities outside of the community and the state. Um, while it's a concern, if I look at the 108 corridor, what it's been historically, what it is today, and what it's growing towards, this is an area with a lot of large commercial and small industrial applications on it. Appearance standards have never been well followed on this route. We've got a lot of facilities on this route that are corporate dictated, tractor supply, the Jeep dealership down the road, the Subaru dealership down the road. If I'm thinking about where appearance standards have a very heavy weight in this town, it's the area around where we are right now. If I look at 108 and that chunk of high street towards Dover, it's already big box development. So I'm more comfortable with that kind of structure in this area than I would be anywhere else in the city. I think that's important to note. I think you've done everything you can do with this plan. I think if any, if we were to vote to deny it here tonight, it would be because we were fundamentally saying that it was an inappropriate use for that site. And I don't think we can say that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Witham, then Mr. Berry. Thank you. Uh, I'd piggyback on Mr. Rhodes' comment about the uh, architecture of the building, and although it may be dictated, if you will, uh, I think it blends in this corridor. Um, um, I, I, it would not blend down here, and I think if you were to try to put a building there that represents New England-style architecture, help me with that because I struggle with that all of the time, uh, it would look out of place out there, right? So uh, I, I, I'm not terribly concerned about that. Um, I think there is a lot going on on this lot, and we talk about the DOT yet again imposing maybe. And although we're not yet at final design, uh, DOT has been in these chambers with uh, a very detailed, more than a concept design, right? It's, it's, it's close to final in terms of what they want to do, uh, which shows that being a signalized intersection there, enhanced sidewalks both sides, at least through that portion. So I, I think we have a good feel for what the DOT is going to look to do. How much land taking will be necessary is a great question, but uh, I don't think it's like totally open-ended uh, at the end of the day. Again, I, I, I appreciate the, the explanation as to why so many waivers that, that resonates with me, so thank you for that. Um, I do want to be mindful of uh, the neighbors, right? That is uh, uh, close in terms of uh, abutting them. I think you've done a nice job with sort of the design of the building. There's only one overhead door that faces the rear. Uh, full disclosure, I drive a Jeep. I've been to the new Jeep dealership a quarter mile down the road. Um, you can't hear anything outside. It, it's quiet, right? So uh, I know we've had concern with some other auto repair facilities that I don't think that's going to be the case here. So I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about noise. I want to be mindful of it, and I think the applicant should be as well. Uh, but the lighting, I think, is the big one. Uh, I think to the degree that we can leverage motion sensing to satisfy security concerns but not beyond all the time, I think is really something that I'm going to advocate for here tonight and probably will look to weave a condition in uh, around that. Uh, and then, again, just to be consistent with what we've done on the 108 corridor to talk about the sidewalk thing uh, in more detail at some point. So I'll leave it at that. Otherwise, I think I'm in support of this project. Mr. Berry. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Rhodes took the words literally out of my mouth. I was going to say the same exact thing. I, I think it's appropriate, and in that part of town, it makes a lot of sense. Big box doors, we don't really have that New England architecture, so um, I think it actually fits in. But I agree, anywhere else in town, I'd probably be flagging it. Um, beyond that, uh, two things come to mind. The drainage, um, you know, because the, uh, as the former civil engineer of the group, um, I'm very pleased with the improvements that you guys have done. Um, I can tell you, um, 0.77 CFM for a 100-year storm, that's nothing, guys. I mean, that's eight and a half inches in 24 hours. That's a deluge. Last time, last time we saw that much it was when the dams were being uh, threatened to break, right? That was about 20 years ago, right? So we can deal with one CFM. I have no problem with that. Um, as far as lighting, I agree with Councillor Witham. Um, I would like to see some degree of um, motion sensor, but I will remind the board that across the street in both directions at 3 a.m. those lights are on, okay, and they are quite bright, right? So anything you do will be an improvement. Um, I won't make it mandatory. If any, if anybody else wants to make that a condition, I'll probably end up going with it. Sure. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions from the board? Very right, well. We'll go into the waiver request. Looking for a motion for waiver, waiver number one. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Horton. Move that the request of Bill Doobie, LLC, for a waiver from section 12.4.A.5 of the site plan review regulations requirement to allow 69 parking spaces where 111 spaces are required be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton. Second by Mr. Robitis. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Maintain the motion for waiver number two. All right. Mr. Horton? Uh, I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for a waiver from section 12.4.B.2 of the site plan review regulations requirement to provide longitudinal, longitudinal 
Traffic islands for parking lots with more than two parallel islands be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton. Second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number three. Mr. Horton. This helps with the minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, waiver number three is uh, I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for a waiver from uh, 12B, 124B7 of the site plan review regulations requirement to allow paved areas to be less than 15 feet from property line be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Contain a motion for waiver number four. I move that the request to Bill Doobie for the waiver from section 124B73 of the site plan review regulations uh, for the requirement to provide one deciduous shade tree for every 15 parking spaces be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Any discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Contain a motion for waiver number five. Move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for the waiver from 124B74 of the site plan review regulations requiring that all landscaped areas shall be protected from encroachment of vehicles by curb and landscaping timbers, curb stops, or other acceptable means be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Obtain a motion for waiver number six. I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for the waiver from 124B85 of the site plan review regulations requiring shade trees be provided around the perimeter of all parking areas at a minimum ratio of one tree per 20 feet of parking lot perimeter be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Take a motion for waiver number seven. Number seven. Move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for a waiver from 124B86 of the site plan review regulations requirement that off street parking areas located at the front or side of principal buildings shall be screened from public right of way with appropriate screening be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Entertain a motion. Entertain a motion for waiver number eight. Number eight, I move that the request to Bill Doobie for the waiver from 125CI of the site plan review regulations, requirement to construct sidewalks, be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. Mr. Witham. Would the applicant be amenable to a condition on this that uh, in conjunction with the city engineer uh, a calculation will be made at the cost of what it would cost to construct the sidewalk and the applicant will make a contribution uh, to the city's uh, appropriate fund uh, in the amount of 25% of the cost of the sidewalk. Who would be? Mr. Ord and Mr. Robitis, go with the You good uh, with that proposal? condition? Yeah. I would amend the uh, condition, yeah. Thank amend you. the motion. And I appreciate to, the applicant's yeah. uh, willingness to work with us on that. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number nine. Number nine. I move that the request of Bill Doobie for the waiver from 126D. Eight of the site plan review regulations requirement to provide a Class A buffy yard be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Did you get the? Contain motion for waiver number ten. I move that the request of Bill Doobie for a waiver from 127BI of the site plan review regulation requirement for new construction be compatible with the traditional New England architecture design be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. 
Those in favor raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Entertain a, entertain a motion for waiver number 11. Waiver number 11, I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for the waiver from 12.7 B3 of the site plan review regulation requiring and allow the requirement and allow metal siding on the rear. I'm going to start over on that one. I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for the waiver from 12.7 B3 of the site plan review regulations requirement and allow metal siding on the rear of the building and back portion of its sides be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number 12. I move that the request of Bill Doobie for a waiver from 12.7 B4 of the site plan review regulations and allow for construction of a building with long expanse unbroken roof line be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number 13. Waiver number 13, I move that the request of Bill Doobie for the waiver from 12.7 B7 of the site plan review regulation and allow EIFS within eight feet of the bottom of an exterior wall be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number 14. Shall I keep going? All right. All right go ahead. Take one. All right, here we go. <laughs> waiver number 14 is I move that the request of Bill Dewey for the waiver from 12.7 B8 of the site plan review regulations requirement to have all rooftop mechanical equipment screened from view be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton. Second by Mr. Rhodes. Discussion, Mr. Rabajas. Is there a way that we can, like I said, discuss this? You would be able to shut down the screen. I would only say uh, in the perspective views with the renderings of the building that we've provided, um, it's pretty clear that um, those units are shielded. Those are the actual units. Um, we, they're correctly scaled on there. They're not just a block. Uh, it's actually the units that were sized for the building. Um, and prior to it being built, I feel like that's the farthest we can take it to, to prove it. Um, but yeah. As, you can see it's Mr. Witham. I don't know if this will help at all, but <clears throat> our new fire station has an array of HVAC units that are pad mounted, pad mounted on the side of the building. They're not on the roof. Um, and recently, the uh, we've chosen to screen them with a uh, vinyl fence. Uh, but the vinyl fence, I think, only goes eight feet high, and these units probably go 10 at, at their highest point. And although you could still see them, uh, it looks tremendously better. And I liken that to the parapet. If, you, if they didn't have the parapet and you could see the entire unit, I think it would be obtrusive. Uh, but I think with, you know, if we're only going to see five, maybe 10 percent of the unit, I think it's, it's de minimis, and I think uh, I'm not terribly concerned with it. Well, I think it's a few inches, and I, I, I don't disagree. I just, that other business, you can see a lot of those units coming from both directions, and that's not what I'm interested in seeing. So Absolutely. I'm, I'm okay with this. Mr. Barry. Is there the option of possibly painting the units? What, what color are the, are the units, do you know? Are they gray, white? I'd assume they're tan. Gray. Most, most of them are, yeah. Could may, maybe uh, could that be an option to paint it the same color as? But then the you have them chipping, and in two or three years now, the little bit that you can see looks. Well, once installed, I mean it's a, I mean it's another option. Yeah. In, in, in addition, if, if I may, um, when we file for the building permit and have, um, you know, that that parapet will be detailed in there, um, that the building inspector when they review will be able to determine that that parapet actually is built the way that we're proposing it. 
and that that's satisfactorily. Mr. Mr. Belmore. Uh, perhaps you want to amend the waiver that no more than 5% can be visible, some sort of percentage, because that's what we're getting is there's no more than 5%. I'm amendable to that. That's the waiver. If they can't comply with the waiver, they need to come back. Just trying to push it along, but okay. I, don't that's... I, I, I could live with that. Because yeah. I think Councilman Witham gave a perfect example with the fire station. You can still see it, but boy, it's, it's an improvement. Yeah. Any further discussion? Mr. Horton, you're amenable to the change. And Mr. Rhodes? Okay, so motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Rhodes. Any further discussion? Do we need to define who is going to define that 5%? It will be the building inspector. It will be the inspector. Okay. Do we need that in our in our writing? No? All right, well, it's good. it's going to be a condition, doesn't it? If we're going for a waiver. So. Okay, Hort, just at the discretion of, of city staff. Modified waiver. Yes, okay. and that so will be discussed. listed in the notice of decision. Any further discussion? Motion made by Mr. Horton, second by Mr. Rhodes. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number 15. Motion number 15. I move that the request of Bill Doobie LLC for a waiver from Section 12.8B of the Site Plan Review Regulations requirement that illumination levels at property boundaries shall not exceed 0.2 foot candles for receiving commercial properties be denied. Tonight, right? Tonight. Motion made by Mr. Horton. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Richardson. Discussion? Discussion. Mr. Horton? So I, I um, went that way because it sounds like, you know, we're having some concern about abutting properties. So I think there are engineering revisions that the applicant can do to address those concerns so I'm also open to discussion here but uh, really that's why I made the motion is to hear out some discussion mr. with thank you yep you threw me a curveball Chris uh, with, with the denied motion uh, I was going to jump on board and say would you be amenable to a condition with regard to motion sensing uh, on the lights on the rear facade of the building uh, I think that helps considerably those are the close lights and you say well geez they're they're lower than the light poles yes but if you're still you know 10 12 feet up on a building which is what they appear to be uh, that's over the fence height so I get the security but I think motion sensing is a technology that's out there mr. Belmore is that more appropriate for the next waiver as opposed to this one the next waiver talks about a timer and shutoff wasn't that more of our concern than the, uh, the uh, illumination levels? I'm a little confused. I suppose it could go in either one. Uh, what is the, can the applicant guide us on what would be, what his take is on this perhaps? As to which waiver that that would apply to? Um, is it both? I mean, it's, it, or if we're talking, if the second one, Number 17 has to do with, or sorry, 16 has to do with the timing of that, because uh, I would assume that the condition of approval that you're suggesting would be for the night for the night time that certain uh, those certain lights would be put on a timer or on a motion um, seems to fit better to me, but it's your discretion. Any further discussion? Does the director have any take on that? Uh, if we deny this one, don't they have to come back with some other level of illuminations? And they would have to revise the plan so that it meets the site plan regulation, and um, the illumination is not um, going over onto the adjacent property, which is the uh, interstate glass property. That's where uh, it's higher. It's 3.5 foot candles. Correct. Mr. Chairman, I wish to rescind my motion. Mr. Horton wishes to rescind his motion. Is there a new motion? I'll 
Mr. Woodman. Yes, I'd move that uh, the site lighting uh, uh, waiver be approved on uh, number 15 and 16. Uh, so I'm combining both for the approval uh, with the condition that uh, the lighting on the rear of the building uh, be motion activated. Motion made by Mr. Witham for item 15 16, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Any discussion? Mr. Belmore. So is th th there's um, is it always on motion or, or is it on a timer and then it f and then it's then it uh, transitions to motion? How does that work? By uh, my understanding would be so all all the, the lights that are on a timer are on a timer, and then these building mounted lights would shut off at that later time that is specified in there um, and would be motion sensor at that point. Any further discussion? All those in favor raise your right hand. Opposed? Waiver 15 and 16 are granted. Contain a motion for waiver number 17. Waiver number 17. I move that the request to build Dewey LLC for a waiver from section 1217A79 of the site plan review regulations requirement that all permanent drainage structures shall not be located within one half the requirement minimum setback as set forth by the zoning ordinance be approved. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? Those in favor raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Entertain a motion for waiver number 18. Number 18, I move that the request to build Doobie LLC to allow a storage box, EV battery storage container, be allowed for more than one, um, be approved. Motion by Mr. Horton, second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion? Mr. Rhodes and then Mr. Witham. So that if one of them does light up, then it can be separately controlled. And I was a little unclear in the site plan, but is there, are there utilities going to that storage facility? Okay, so it's just a, a box on site. Okay, so for future. So, so yeah, water sorry. lines stubbed to the site, but stubbed to the site for place. future. Yep. Uh, given the amount of water required to deal with an EV battery fire, it probably needs something more than water. Um, <clears throat> so given that, I would question whether this waiver should be set to allow storage in perpetuity as it's a safety concern on site. And we'd be interested in comments from the remainder of the board for that. Mr. Witham. Yeah, I'm fine with the in perpetuity. I understand the safety need. It makes all the sense in the world. This is a waiver from the zoning ordinance. Does that not need to go before the zoning board, I guess is my question. In the zoning ordinance, it states um, a period of one year, year or extended by the planning board. So the planning board can make the decision during site plan approval. That's an excellent answer, particularly for the applicant. So I am fully on board with this, uh, this one. Any further so, discussion, Mr. Berry? So is there a permanent solution? So th this is a means to an end. What, what is the long-term solution? Is Does something have to be built? and? added on permanently I think if you put a waiver uh, if you state in the waiver request in perpetuity that is the long-term solution because it's the planning board's discretion to grant the waiver but then they'll the be zone. on the hook to have to come back here regularly to extend no 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 in perpetuity oh. forever. 
I gotta give me a dictionary. Good lord. <laughs> okay, fine by me. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The waiver is granted. Next is to entertain a motion for a voluntary lot merger. So moved. Second. Motion made by Mr. Witham, second by Mr. Belmore. Any discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The motion passes. Next is the site plan application request. Uh, I'll ask uh, Director Mears to review the conditions of approval. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, plan revisions, please note on the plan that all deliveries shall be dur during normal business hours. I did discuss with um, the engineer about this requirement. Planning staff did have concerns about deliveries, especially the large trucks coming in late at night, especially uh, at the abutting property with Colonial Village. So that's why we put that condition on the plan. Um, but I think from what I understand, they're gonna ask for that condition to be removed. Uh, a hydrant shall be added to the property to the left of the Blackwater Road entrance to the satisfaction of the fire chief and public works director. And the hydrant shall be left open. Cloud Eddy or Kennedy K81 private hydrants shall be painted yellow. Uh, please revise the dumpster screening per chapter 11A. Dumpster shall, dumpster so that it is o an opaque material similar to the vinyl fence. Add a note on the plan that states all service activities will be conducted indoors and there will be no exterior storage of fluids or, par or parts. Please list all the waivers granted on the plan. Applicant shall address any outstanding comments from Horsley Wynn, third party review to the satisfac satisfaction of the Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, please update the parking calculations. Conditions that must be met prior to final approval. The plan shall bear the stamp and signature of an engineer, licensed land surveyor, and landscape architect and um, be submitted. Federal and state permits. Federal and state permits shall be in place before plan siding included but not limited to New Hampshire DES alteration of terrain. The New Hampshire DOT driveway permit shall be in place prior, prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy and that was discussed at the last planning board meeting. Uh, a completed voluntary merger form with a check made payable to the Stratford County Registry of Deeds for the cost of recording. If there is a mortgage on the properties, the mortgage holder must provide written consent and approval in uh, recordable evidence. Uh, conditions to be completed prior to the start of site work. Uh, construction cost estimate shall be submitted to the department. Building plans shall bear the stamp of a certified protection engineer licensed in the state of New Hampshire. A pre-construction meeting is required. An escrow account in the amount set by the city's contract engineer and agreeable to the Department of Development Services uh, will be established for site construction inspections and prior to any start work start of work, a performance surety in the amount agreeable to the Department of Development Services but not less than 25% of the cost of site construction determined by the engineer's estimate of construction value will be established for on-site erosion controls and site restoration prior to any site work and off-site improvements. The applicant shall apply for a new water sewer connection permit. The applicant will be required to pay standard water and sewer connection fees assessed on the new properties. The applicant shall obtain all applicable permits during Department of Public from the Department of Public Works. This is included driveway permit, utility pole license, and trench permits. Erosion tr controls uh, shall be installed prior uh, to the start of construction, and uh, erosion controls shall be properly maintained throughout construction and repaired within 48 hours. Landscaping uh, surety. Uh, is 10% of the total cost of landscaping or a minimum of $500, whichever is greater. All applicants requiring stormwater and erosion control plans submit relevant pollutant accounting information to the Director of Planning and Community Development as required by Public Works. Uh, this shall be updated, uh, this shall be submitted prior to pre-construction and post-construction pollutant information must be entered at the time of as-builts are submitted. Conditions applicable during and after construction 
The structure will be required to be assigned a new address. Please submit a request for a new address to the city engineer. Uh, also on that, uh, per section 1923E9, the building shall be displayed uh, address numbers. Uh, a copy of a completed stormwater inspection and maintenance log shall be provided to the Deve Department of Development Services annually on or before July 1st. All landscaping shown on the plan shall be maintained. Maintained any dead or dying vegetation shall be replaced in a timely manner. All outdoor lighting, including security lights, lights shall be downlit and shielded so that no direct light is visible from adjacent properties. Uh, that this is the condition that was added. Applicant will work with the city engineer on a contribution of 25% the cost of construction um, go into the appropriate fund prior to the certificate of occupancy. Sidewalk. Construction of sidewalk, yep. Uh, as built plans will be re required along the, the front. sidewalk is along the frontage of Route 108 uh, and uh, just to be consistent uh, the, we, the state is proposing that that be vertical granite curb with a uh, hot top sidewalk five feet wide so th there's the particulars of that and that's it now you have one more uh an item at the beginning, uh, uh, item for discussion, the driveway permit and how long it takes. Is, is that something we still have to address? Or? Uh, that discussion does not need to happen anymore because um, of how we conditioned it uh, shall be in place prior to is issuance of certificate of occupancy. Okay. So it should be struck. In the staff memo. Entertain a slight point motion. Question, uh, Mr. Belmo? Yes. On the plan revisions, A, all deliveries shall be during normal business hours. I don't know what normal business hours are anymore, and is any concern to place a, a PM, AM or PM ta actual time? I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what a normal business. Correct. So it's our concern, is it? Yeah, it has to be after seven, before six. Well, I don't know what it is. Uh, just to speak to this, uh, during the SRTC uh, review process, the applicant did state that uh, the large uh, trucks that come in it could come during uh, nighttime hours, and the concern was that. Uh, those trucks could impact the abutting property. So I think there's a way to revise this uh, so that those trucks have to put deliveries in a certain area of the property uh, so that it's not impacting Colonial Village. So not in the rear of the property, delivery should not be being emptied out back there. If, if I may, um, just to add on to that, we also discussed how the frequency of these deliveries, um, they're not every day, it's not a Walmart or some big store that's getting tons of trucks every day. It's not a warehouse. Um, they get the cars when they get the cars, which uh, typically is uh, much less than one per day. Um, as for parts, they come a little bit more frequently, but it's much smaller vehicles than um, what you probably have in your head of the, the big car carriers. I'm not worried about the frequency. I'm worried about the time. Right. That's what I'm worried about. Yep because of the, the neighborhood. Yeah, and so I'd also add to that um, that the deliveries, particularly the parts, uh, come from uh, the Dewey's logistics provider um, that isn't, they do not come at a specified time. Um, and I would also share your concern with the proposed normal business hours. Um, Lots of deliveries happen at many businesses outside of normal delivery hours. Um, and we would request that uh, this uh, revision or this note um, either be removed or so amended that um, doesn't interfere with the, the operations of the business. Mr. Witham and Mr. Richardson. I get the intent. I think policing it is difficult. Um, sort of like policing, keeping a garage door closed, right? It's <laughs> the same sort of thing. Amen to that. So I, I'm a, a bit reluctant to impose a condition that is hard to police. 
uh, particularly the way it's written now, you know, define normal business hours, time is better. Um, it's been my experience that I don't work in a car dealership, but I've seen at times like a tractor trailer unit that's delivering cars might arrive at like four in the morning and the driver will stay in his cab, maybe take a nap uh, and wait till the business opens to offload the cars. But so they pull up and they park. Right. And I think that's maybe what could happen on occasion. Uh, I think most of your parts deliveries are going to be during the day. Uh, they're not going to want to leave the parts outside, right? So uh, I, I think we're trying to police something that doesn't need to be policed. And the fact of the matter is we have a noise ordinance, and if that is being impacted, that is problematic for the applicant. We could bring them back in for a compliance hearing. So um, I'm, I think I'm okay with striking that condition. But. Mr. Richardson. Mr. That, that in particular is one of the issues that I was talking about that was corporate guided. And um, I, I, I really have a problem with, the, with nighttime uh, deliveries. I mean, how is, an, how is a resident or somebody driving by supposed to know whether there is a, an attempted burglary taking place or if this is a delivery, if it's in the middle of the night or whenever it is after dark? And, and I'm worried about maybe potential phone calls to our police department that there's people m moving around in here that are unwarranted and taking their time. Um, that just, it doesn't make sense to me at all to not have a time frame where the deliveries can be delivered. And, and certainly not, I mean, after, hour, after hours, I don't think so. That just doesn't go with me. Mr. Belmore. I brought this up because I didn't like the amb ambiguity, um, but um, uh, I'm willing to uh, remove it quite frankly because I don't know how we define it. And uh, um, relying on the noise ordinance or, or compliance here, and, um, and I, I, you know, we have several car dealerships along the corridor. Granted, they don't directly abut as close as this one perhaps does, although the Jeep is right, right behind a uh, residential, as noted earlier. I don't recall ever having a complaint, although I'm not the police department, um, or a code complaint about, or a noise complaint in regards to delivery of vehicles or parts. And it seems to make sense that maybe let this play out. Um, I don't know how we buttonhole times. Mr. Barry. Yeah, I completely understand where, where Mr. Richardson is coming from. But granted, if we take that perspective, well, let's look at the other services that are, uh, that are provided in the evening, right? Trash collection. A lot of that happens at night, right? Um, you know, well, you know, at the same time, you know what it comes down to is you have to be a good neighbor. Be courteous of those around you, because if you're not, we're going to come get you. <laughs> you'll, you'll be back on the horns. Trust me, we've had it before. So um, I'm willing to strike it personally. Um, just be a good neighbor. Absolutely. And the one thing I'll add to that is, you know, the, the doobies have been running uh, business in Dover currently for a very long time. Um, they pride themselves on being good neighbors, stewards of the community. They're happy to be um, adding a lo location here in Summersworth. Um, and they have all the intent in the world to be the best neighbors they can be. Um, they're a family owned business um, and they, you know, their business relies on, um, you know, the opinions of those in the community, right? So they um, they care about how people perceive them, for, for sure, and uh, will do uh, do what they need to do to be good neighbors. Mr. Revitus? I don't want, you know, I are we overthinking this, so to speak? I don't know if I'm in favor of removing this, um, just so we have something. I don't know if I want to rely on the noise ordinance. Can it be as simple as saying when you unload cars, we're going to require you to unload in the front of the business? Uh, is there, if you look at the plan, there's room. Um, so we do have a, a shown uh, truck plan for where are those larger trucks can pull through and deliver. Um, questioning if we show where they would. Yeah. I, right. And it, yeah. 
so we could add a note on the plan that shows or speaks to where uh, where those deliveries would take place because they would they wouldn't be taking place in the rear of the site right up against the the property line of the butters the parts deliveries are on the south side of the building parts deliveries will be during the day for the most part correct my uh, my thought is you know you said it's it doesn't have a big occurrence but you know if somebody's sound asleep at two in the morning is going to get up to go to work and this happens once every other night that's a bother absolutely it could it be as simple as just unloading and something that's not the rear of the building it, it's yeah to so to to clarify that that they can't um they can't unload in that aisle right behind the building between the building and the back property line you're suggesting no i'm suggesting anything that's close to the neighbors in the back is close to the neighbors correct correct so to not unload there right okay so if that's correct. what you're saying yeah. Yeah, it could be as simple as that Mr. Oh, yeah. Horton? Yeah, I think I'm ready to make a motion. I move that to the request of Bill Doobie Key LLC for the site plan approval for a 22,000 square foot car dealership with associated access ways and parking infrastructure be approved with the conditions outlined in the director's memo and striking 1A and including the off site improvements for the sidewalks. Motion made by Mr. Horton. So the motion is seconded by Mr. Witham. Discussion. Mr. Witham. Listen to the applicant. If I may, we just had we had one more note on one of these items. Just please behave you well. Okay. Yeah. The the other uh, if, if I may. Um, so the other item that we just wanted to comment on is the opaque um, material of the dumpster screening. <laughs> Uh, currently, we're showing uh, vinyl slats in the metal fence. Um, in our experience, as well as the, the applicant's experience, that opaque, um, that opaque uh, PVC or vinyl, that opaque vinyl fence um, being solid uh, presents definitely an opportunity for, especially in the winter, um, any dumpster that happens to touch it or the truck touches it or something um, presents a big opportunity for for damage pretty easily um, we feel like the the solution that we have in the plan set um, showing the vinyl slats but uh, the more forgiving material um, of the, the enclosure itself um, is, a, is a lot more reasonable uh, I'll make a motion that we amend that condition to allow for vinyl slat fencing around the dumpster Everybody okay with that? So moved. Any further discussion? So I just want to be clear. So we're not doing anything with where they load or unload or time frame. When does the motion include taking that it section does. out? So it includes the motion includes taking one A out. Okay. Any further discussion? Mr. Witham. Yeah, not to belabor the point. And I, and I hear Mr. Robitis' concern, and I think the applicant, I think just logically they're going to unload on the south side of the building, not in that narrow passageway to the rear. Um, I think the other thing is define delivery. Is the car carrier pulling up and parking? Well, that's not delivery. That's getting ready to deliver because they're not going to unload till the morning, and that's delivery, right? So kind of splitting hairs here. So I think it's going to manage itself. I really do. I don't perceive it to be a problem that we need to solve. Any further discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Site plan is approved. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, we get into new business, the so zoning audit workshop with Stratford Regional Planning Commission. Director Mears, anything to add? Uh, yes, Stratford Regional Planning Commission uh, did provide a final report, and it should have been on your desk this evening. Uh, they're going to give a quick presentation. 
PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to get the slides up? Thank you. Oh, we're good. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Davey. I'm one of the planners over at Stratford Regional Planning Commission. I'm really happy to be here. Um, we were here before you previously. Um, we uh, presented our your housing chapter of the master plan earlier this year as part of the uh, Housing Opportunity Hop grant series. Um, we came before you again at your April workshop to d discuss our initial findings of the um, zoning audit. Um, a zoning audit, for those who aren't aware, essentially we examine a city's or town's full zoning audit and just poke a bunch of little holes in it, see where there's conflicting information, conflicting um, consistent issues that may be popping up in the map, um, and play with it a little bit. Um, so in the full report before you, um, this is sort of our framework for how it's organized. Um, previously, we this of course happened at the began at the tail end of the housing chapter of the master plan. Um, of course, there were some goals and strategies outlined there uh, that we came up with, um, and then we added on a little bit of extra community engagement just for the audit. Uh, we conducted some developer interviews earlier this year. We spoke with not just the planning board, we spoke with the mayor's task force, um, and I'll get into a little bit more of what went into those discussions as well. Um, the next section is gonna be the audit findings themselves. Um, we identified four very high level categories or areas that um, for consideration, things we flagged. Um, of course, there's going to be a little bit of overlap for each of those topics, but we'll get into that in a second. Um, those four areas are the structure and organization of your zoning ordinance and just how the map appears. Um, next is going to be infill development and barriers to it. Um, next is going to be diversity of housing types. Missing middle is kind of a buzzword we hear in the planning world quite a bit these days, and I'll get into that. Um, and then site plan and subdivision regulations. Um, next, we took some of the, um, after discussing with the mayor's task force and others and yourselves, you completed an organizational um, ranking activity. We took some of the ones that were the most pressing, most urgent, the ones that needed a little bit more working on some work, some uh, geographical work with the zoning map, um, and we prepared extra recommendations for those items. Um, you may be familiar with the build-out analysis that we, con we uh, conducted as part of the housing chapter. Um, we massaged the, sc the scenario that came out of that one and implemented a second one for the audit. Um, we don't have a ton of time tonight, so we're not going to super dive into that, but the methodology is in the full audit report with maps. So again, we came to the planning board in April, and we had a list. Um, we realized that it was a lot of information to digest that evening. So we took it back, and we um, sat down with Michelle uh, and team and decided that it would be best to include all of the land use boards and the mayor's task force. So um, we had them rank the strategies by 
whether they were feasible, are they realistic strategies to altering, adjusting the zoning ordinance in pursuit of um, more housing opportunity, um, and how impactful they, that would actually be? Would it result in smarter or more housing? Um, as I said, it came out into four categories in varying um, degrees of how urgently they need to be addressed, but I'll get into that in a second. First and foremost, the organization of the zoning ordinance and the zoning map itself. Um, there are 17 zoning districts and a lot, a lot of overlays as this map illustrates. Um, in one example, the historic moderate density base district just outside of downtown here uh, refers to itself as an overlay district um, in its purpose and description. And then the Milliard form base code overlay is treated as a base district in um, the use table for the whole zoning ordinance. Um, so there's a lot to work with here in the map and the structure of the ordinance. Next, as I said, we have infill development. Um, this comes from how localized of a flavor of housing we can get. Um, are there opportunities for empowering residents to maybe add units to the properties they already own? Are there opportunities for smaller landlords to have more units, maybe rather than corporate big box landlords? Yeah. Um, so that was our second strategy, second area. Third, missing middle, as I said, a little bit of a buzzword right now. Um, and what it came down to is strategies for future growth. Route 108 just came up in your application tonight. Um, it is an area of interest. Um, the commercial industrial and commercial node districts currently don't allow residential. Understandably, that's quite the can of worms, but should the city decide to pursue more residential there, there should be a plan. Um, planned unit development has a bit of a reputation for just being massive tracks of many, 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 many single family homes. There are, it actually, there's all different types. Um, in New Hampshire, um, Concord's planned unit development ordinance is one to watch out for. They have sort of a mix and match style that we really liked. Um, it lists out five different types of housing um, and sort of a pick, you have to pick two. It, it has to be a mixed approach. Um, you can do it on all different sizes of land. Um, it's not just major greenfield, plop this down. Mixed use, again, kind of another buzzword. Um, Dover is one that is, um, Dover's Point Place is one that came up that was interesting to us. Um, mixed density and mixed use housing found there. Lastly, the site plan and subdivision regulations. A um, lot of parking discussion, of course. Um, there is a parking study coming down the pipeline for summer's worth, so we sort of came to the conclusion that this is one that can be tabled for a little bit later. Um, for the purpose of the audit, we dove into sort more of the map and ordinance kind of concerns. Um, as I said, we dove deeper into um, a select few of the items that we found, some of the ones that bleed into each other a little bit, some of the ones that are a little bit bigger lift, um, kind of setting you up for success should you decide to apply for a, a third hop grant. Um, so the first priority action is, like I described, planned unit development and Route 108 area. Um, I laid out what Concord and Dover have done. There's a few more examples in New Hampshire in there as well. The second action, um, the recategorization of multifamily housing. Um, this is adding to the missing middle conversation and it's adding to the very localized housing conversation. Um, Summersworth divides it into one unit, single family dwellings, two unit dwellings, may or may not be detached, may or may not be a duplex, and then multifamily housing, three or more units. Not, not really, really out there, pretty typical. But um, we were wondering if one, it, a better categorization might be one and two, three and four, five to 10, and then 11 and up. Um, 
part of this discussion also came up because um, some across the different boards, some members were concerned that there's a lot of attention paid to downtown Summersworth with the form-based code overlay and uh, things that go on in the business district and the others. Um, this might be a way to address housing in other neighborhoods. Um, we, of course, would leave alone the ones that already allow three or more units, so we're not adding more wires to trip over. Um, we would instead bump up just a little bit some of the R1, R2 districts, for example. The third one, probably the biggest one, is the map and district modifications. So I will show you your current zoning dis uh, map of downtown. Um, this one does not have the form-based code overlay, but the most significant part that we're proposing is um, converting the form-based code overlay to a base district rather than keeping it as an overlay. We think by having base districts underneath it, it sort of undermines the intent and purpose of having a form-based code style zoning. Um, what's really interesting, for example, the residential business base district currently almost perfectly matches one of the form-based code overlays right now. Um, so again, it's it's just kind of redundant. So this is what we're proposing. Um, like I described, the form-based code overlays become base districts in their own right. Um, the other notable adjustment is the consolidation of the R1 and R1A, and then the R2 and R2A districts to become just R1 and just R2. Um, in the audit, you'll find uh, the current dimensional standards for those four districts, um, and there's really not a huge amount of difference. Um, notably, the build-out analysis from last time, from the housing chapter earlier this year, uh, one of the goals there was just conformity, period, across the zoning map and the any parcel in Summersworth. Um, it's it's kind of a problem it it's the nonconformity is a problem for people who are looking to expand not just housing but unrelated stuff like decks and additions so we're thinking if we relax some of these dimensional requirements in those R districts then it might address more than just some housing issues as well so just one more time the current and the proposed have i lost anybody Questions, comments? Yes, please. Uh, at the Mayor's Housing Task Force uh, last week, uh, the other item we discussed, although we went down the rabbit hole of parking, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, we, we had a pretty lengthy discussion about our current language regarding ADUs. Yes. And that they have to be attached. And I think there's an appetite of our, of the Housing Task Force to begin exploring how we might adopt language to allow detached ADUs. Um, so I think that's another piece that, that, that factors into this. My other comment is uh, I do watch the monthly zoning board meetings, and there are lessons to be learned there because you see sort of the same things over and over again. And if people need to seek relief over and over again, that just says to me, our zoning ordinance is broken if we need to constantly have relief. So, uh, and much of that relief is sought uh, in this downtown urban core because we have so many conflicting standards, overlays, uh, and nonconformity to start with that it's hard to do anything. So, I appreciate the comments around that and would welcome, quite frankly, a simplified uh, zoning map. Uh, I think simple is better. It's easier for property owners. It's easier for developers to understand. Heck, it's easier for me uh, to understand uh, at this level. So uh, I'm in line with the comments that you made here for sure. Yeah. Um, you'll find a dedicated ADU section. I think it's 2.1 or 2.2 .2 of the um, approaches section. But yeah, uh, we address the detached attached thing. Um, 
to your point about a conflict, um, the ZB, you'll find at the very end there's a ZBA appendix. Um, I did scour some ZBA minutes and found what some of those frequent flyer requests were. Um, the ones that stood out to me were the business district ones that are very like floor specific. Um, and a developer actually mentioned that in an interview when it came up the mayor's task force. So like you're hit the nail on the head. It's yeah, it conflicts with the intent of the form based code, which also lays out floor by floor what should be allowed. So for ADUs, we would allow attached or detached. Yes. There would be two options. Yes. Okay. Right now they have to be attached. And Good. Be Sorry, the zoning board has dealt with that maybe a handful of times already. Yeah. Mark, I just want to say thanks for all the work you've done and, and Jen and, and, and your whole team. Uh, you guys have really put in a lot of effort here and a lot of information into the report. So. Um, I hope uh, we continue this journey and partnership and uh, hope, hopeful of uh, phase three of this. So thank you for all your recommendations, comments, and uh, work on it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to squeak in really quick to say um, if you do have comments or, or edits or corrections, please send them to Mark. Um, or you can, Michelle can help you get in touch with us. Uh, we're hoping to have all of those comments in by um, Monday, that'd be July 22nd. Uh, we need to wrap everything up for the grant deadline. The grant closes at the end of the month. So uh, looking to get any comments or questions uh, by, again by Monday. So thank you. One request from the audience, if the board members can please speak into your microphones uh, so the audience can hear you. Make sure the microphones are on. Okay, new business item B. Michael Davis is seeking a conditional use permit for after the fact excavation and alterations within the riparian and wetland buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road in the residential single-family R1 district, assesses map 31, lot 49, CUP number 03-2023. Director Mears? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, conditional use permit information, the applicant completed work on the property within the wetland buffer between years 2010 and 2022 without first receiving required conditional use permits. Uh, there is a history that staff uh, compiled for the planning board members. The restoration plan includes restoring approximately 1,700 square feet of wetlands, removal of portions of the culvert remaining 30 feet of culvert to allow for access, removal of the deck, retaining uh, the boulders in the same location, replanting the zero to 50 foot buffer as indicated in the report submitted by wetland scientist mark jacobs dated 7 8 2024 the restoration plan includes providing monitoring and status reports for two growing seasons uh, and that would be to the planning office the conservation commission uh, recommendation the conservation commission has reviewed this application at a number of meetings including a site walk conducted uh, back in november 2023 at 7-10-2024, the Conservation Commission meeting, the Conservation Commission voted, recommended approval with the following recommended conditions of approval. Monitoring and removal of any aquatic invasives within the pond based on recommendations by New Hampshire Department of D Environmental Services. Any fallen woody, woody debris within the pond shall remain and not be removed unless uh, this was not in the staff report uh, and conditional use permit uh, be obtained. Uh, regular monitoring for two years in compliance with any outcomes of monitoring report results as indicated in the restoration plan. Staff recommends that the board accept this application as complete and begin the review process. And take a motion to accept the application. Motion. Mr. Uh, Rhodes. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes. 
Second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The application is accepted. This time I'd like to invite uh, Representative Michael Davis to please uh, make their presentation. Good evening. My name is Marsha Brown, and um, Michael Davis has retained me to represent him and hopefully get him over the finish line in complying with the local and state uh, wetlands rules. And you Can said, "Pres." Can you speak up, please? How, uh, my name is Marsha Brown with NH Brown Law. Is that okay? Thank you. <laughs> and um, again, I, uh, Mike Davis has um, retained me to um, help him get the restoration plan um, in order and comply with the local wetlands rules as well as the Department of Environmental Services state wetlands rules. So I understand you have before you the finalized plan from the wetland scientist with a proposed uh, plan, survey plan attached to it. We have presented to the Conservation Commission, which resulted in the conditions and that uh, Director Mears just recited. I saw Director Mears' staff report today and spoke with staff about the addition on page one uh, regarding the fallen woody debris and whether that included the, the tall pines that Mr. Davis had wanted to remove that was subject to a separate conditional use permit. And as um, uh, Director Mears just said, there would be an addition to that condition that says that if there is any of, any of those large pines did fall into the, the pond, that it would be a case-specific conditional use permit assessment on whether he could remove those or not. And I don't know what other presentation you're, you were looking for me to give That's you. That's fine if you're, all, if you're all set. Yeah, okay. Uh, this time I'd like to entertain a motion for regional impact. Mr. Richardson. Uh, there is no regional impact. So. Motion by Mr. Richardson, seconded by Mr. Horton. Discussion. Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Thank you. At this time, we'll open the public hearing for any comments. Anybody care to uh, comment on this application? I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing. My name is Rosemarie Kareen. I live at 15 Otis Road. Uh, Mr. Davis is the director butter to my property. I've lived there since 1993. Things were fine, the pond was fine. And then um, starting in about 2008, I think you have a history. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about that history is that all these years I have been going to code enforcement, first Tim, um, then Paul, then um, my ward person, Martin Pepin, and then Tim in for, uh, constantly complaining about the damage that was being done to my, my part of the pond. I live on the low point of the pond. There's Mr. Davis, John, who lives on the high point, and then myself. So over the, all these years, I have been going to code enforcement. At some point around um, 10 years in, Tim informed me that this was not a city matter, and therefore I should not be talking to them because it had nothing to do with the city. I disagreed, but um, at that point, I was told that I should talk to the state, and that's when I started my dealings with David Spice. I, I believe he's the wetlands person for Stratford County. I met with him at my property a number of times, um, the last meeting that I had with him was on uh, Zoom, and then we texted. The last uh, paperwork that I received was in 2019, when Mr. Spice um, presented me with copies of the, I believe you have them in your packet. It was a copy of the um, audit that was being done by the state and all of the violations that Mr. Davis was responsible for. 
back in the very beginning, the city took Mr. Davis to court and he was fined $20,000 and a list of requirements were given to him. He never paid the money because I was told by Tim that he was going to be bankrupt. I have no information about that. Um, all these years, as I spoke to court enforcement, they came to my property. They recognized that over time, I was losing land. So basically what happened is over these last 2008 to present, every time Mr. Davis did something to the pond, there was a reaction to the property being my property on the low point. So one of the things I wanted to bring up is that everything that's happened, the Conservation Commission, nobody asked me anything. Nobody told me it was happening. Um, as far as people who've come to the property and looked at it and agreed with me over the years, nothing ever changed. It didn't matter, um, and I have all the paperwork because I paid the city to make copies, and I believe you have a summary. I spoke with Dana Crosley on Monday because it didn't seem correct to me that all I was receiving was a notice that we were having this meeting. She was kind enough to supply me with the wetlands report, uh, history of violations, and that's why I'm speaking tonight. I might have misunderstood, but I think that you've already accepted the application and you've already accepted the recommendation. Uh, no, I misunderstood. Okay. Um, so I would appreciate, basically, I don't have a problem with anything that could be done to fix the situation. My concern is that I am not part of the process. I have a piece of property, 30 feet of it is flooded. That happened over a period of years. I complained constantly. Um, I complained about the clear cutting, which, you know, the pond didn't have a problem until somebody cut all the trees around it in the buffer zone. And then, of course, decided they needed to put boulders around the pond. So my concern is that I don't know what the mechanism is, but I would like to ask the planning board to take in consideration whether they do that by making it a stipulation. I would like to gain uh, access to my pond, and I'd like it to be the place it was. I know it can never go back to you know 2008. That would be that just can't happen. But at present, a lot of wildlife is gone. I disagree with some of Mr. Jacobs' comments. Um, he did speak to me by phone, which I really appreciate, when he was beginning the process, but then it stalled again. Um, I spoke with Shane Conlin yesterday. He came to my property, took some pictures, um, said he was going to give those to his boss. So the major problem, as I see it, is the situation of drainage. When Mr. Davis dammed one end of the pond, the pond was not able to drain anymore. So right now, um, there's no drainage out of the pond into the creek bed that goes all the way up to Rocky Hill where Mr. Pepin lives. That was stopped when a, a lot of things happened. One thing that happened, which David Spice pointed out continuously, is the outlet was placed higher than the water table. So even though the water increased, it never reached the point where it could drain out. There was also some other problems with drainage, which I think can be addressed. But how do I find a place where I can be considered in this process? I, I don't know how to do that. Uh, my first experience at a planning board, I'm learning a lot, um, but at this moment, there are seven hardwood trees that have fallen into the pond right at my house. That happened because the water continually rose and then the soil, you know, was abraded. Erosion took place. And over the last two or three years, they fell. 
now there are more red oaks and things that are going to fall soon. They're all leaning. So um, my question, I guess, after a lengthy discussion of on my part, sorry. I'm sorry, but I felt this was my only chance to explain. Um, what do I need to do? I don't, I don't know anything about the Conservation Commission except what Mr. Spice told me, but that never happened. So do I just ask you to look into it? Do we do nothing? I, I, I need some advice. I don't need it immediately, but if you could please consider what I've said and maybe um, reach out. I did speak uh, and send emails to David, but he couldn't come. I only received the letter late last week, so he wasn't able to arrange. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it, and I love where I live. Thank you for Thank your input. You. Anybody else care to uh, comment on this application? Director Mears, do you have any uh, correspondence? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We did receive some email correspondence, uh, public comment from property owner MAP 31, lot 52, uh, submitted July 11th, 2024. Dear planning board members, I am Joanne Furland, fourth generation owner of 22 acres of property that abuts the Davis property at 25 Otis Road. My husband, Bill, and I will be out of town on July 17th, so we wanted to share our thoughts with you now. We have had concerns for quite a while about the impacts of the work that has been done on the Davis property and has and will continue to have on our property as well as surrounding community. As you know, the changes have been significant and are close in proximity to a fair amount of wetlands. It is unfortunate that three days ago was the first time we heard from the city in regard to this matter. I want to thank Dana Crosley from the planning office for taking the time to provide us with a quick overview of this ongoing situation. My hope is that moving forward we can be kept in form of actions related to this matter. As I shared with the Conservation Commission, I want to point out a bit of history to clarify a comment made on page two of the wetland restoration report that states the property supports a point nine acre pond which according to current owner was excavated by previous owner Norman and Lillian Fournier who owned the property from 1944 to 1958 and per the current owner the Fourniers also created a wetlands across the wetland swale which provided access to the rear of the property. When my grandparents the Fourniers owned the property there was an existing small natural pond located near Eagle Rock that was not altered by them, nor did they create an access road. Bill and I recall changes to that pond area beginning in the early 2000s. Although it is impossible to go backwards to restore the area to its original state, we feel that steps outlined in the wetlands restoration report are necessary. And we support the plan with the conditions brought to you by the Conservation Commission. We ask this board to take the necessary steps to ensure the plan is followed in its entirety in a timely manner and that recommendations made during the monitoring period are acted on. We do not support the removal of trees from the wetlands buffer or any other work to this protected area and ask that this board hold off on considering a conditional use permit for tree removal until the restoration plan is complete and potential impacts can be reevaluated at that time. Thank you for your time to read this letter and your consideration of our thoughts when making your decision. Best, Joni Furland. Thank you. Are there any other correspondence? Not this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Turn to questions on the board. Mr. Witham. I thank the uh, abutter for speaking tonight. It's very helpful. Uh, I did get the correspondence that was just read into the record. Uh, having sat on the city council now for quite some time, uh, I can only say that this has been uh, for lack of a better term, an embattled property, uh, subject of many violations, not the least of which are what we're discussing here this evening. Um, the, the record would show that we've dealt with uh, the construction of large earthen berms within the city's right of way that had to get moved, um, issues with uh, a violation of a dumpster that is not on a pad and is not screened and 
if Mr. Conlin was out there over the last few days, he should cite him again because the dumpster is yet again uh, exposed. But that's not what we're here for tonight. Uh, I do think that this is a step in the right direction. Uh, there are many steps to be taken here. The, again, this is an embattled property with, with many, many issues. Uh, I, I've asked staff to look at whether or not it's serving as a contractor storage yard, which needs site plan approval. Uh, I'm not sure it qualifies, but it at least deserves investigation. Uh, again, these are all separate matters, but it's part of the history of the property. But I think the most egregious uh, element uh, is what has been done to uh, the area around the pond, uh, the impact to water flow, uh, to neighboring properties, the impact to potential wildlife, or the ecosystem, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I think this is a step in the right direction. Again, given this property, it's probably considered a baby step, but it's a step. So I think I'm supportive of what's going on here uh, th this evening. Uh, Granting this CUP does not make the work happen. So again, we now need to make sure that what's outlined here, what the plan is, actually gets done. Um, I have my reservations, but I, I have hope. So uh, my reservations are just because of, you know, we have a history with this property that goes back to 2008. Uh, it's, it's, it's concerning. As to the impacts on abutting properties, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what we can do as a planning board. I'd be interested in uh, what others have to say about that. More typically than not, those are civil matters between the two property owners and not something the city gets involved with, but uh, I'd welcome other opines on that. Thank you. Mr. Belmore. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, this has been an ongoing matter. Uh, for quite a number of years i don't want to go back in history but part of the reason from my perspective at least why it's here today going through the conservation commission is we've been in superior court over the last several months giving progress reports to a judge to get to this point and i appreciate finally the applicant hiring an attorney to help shepherd this to some uh, positive outcome so this is a step in the right direction um and um Again, um, we'll have to monitor it as some of the conditions indicate. Uh, I don't need to go on too much further, I'll allow other people to speak. Um, what I would ask though is, I'm not clear and maybe I missed it in some of my review of the material, but the uh, email ask from the property owner, uh, Joni Furlan was, let's see, they support they support the plan moving forward in its entirety, so she's on board with what's before us, but I'm not clear about, is, was part of the condition use permit to allow them to uh, remove trees in the wetland buffer? It was. Are there any conditions on that or how many trees or, um, so can you, you help me out with, with that component of it? Sure, sitting on the Conservation Commission, I can ad address both this and the subsequent CUP here uh, and provide a little bit of context from our meetings around this property. I would first completely agree with Mr. Redham's characterization of this as an embattled property and that these are first steps in the right direction. Um, addressing first the, the trees that show up in the second CUP, um, Mr. Davis has a number of pine trees on the property that he would prefer not be there in the buffer zones and has requested a CUP to remove those. Um, on the Conservation Commission, we expressed significant reservations about those in the zero to 50 foot buffer. Uh, they provide substantial shading to the pond and our belief is that given the number of uh, changes that have been inflicted on this site, uh, that one more during the course of a restoration plan of knocking down substantial shade to it could have disastrous implications for the current state of the pond, such as it is. Um, we were hesitantly amenable to removal of two trees that were in the 50 to 100 foot buffer, uh, given that those are likely to have less impact on the pond itself, although there was a degree of hesitancy in our discussion around those. 
dealing with this first CUP for the restoration plan, uh, we went through in a number, in great detail, um, a number of the recommendations that were made by the wetland scientist. Uh, there were boulders placed on the site that, uh, in that wetland scientist estimation, did not necessarily impede the flow of water out of the site, but could serve as a, as a barrier to amphibian migration. Um, he recommended leaving those in place because they do also serve as a barrier to sedimentation uh, downstream from the site and noted that the presence of stable adult populations of fish in the pond that would preclude its use as an amphibian breeding site in the first place. Um, the restoration plan, I would agree with the characterization of it as good first steps. It should restore outflow from the pond on that site, um, should lead to a condition closer to the original state. It includes substantial plantings in the 50, in the 0 to 50 and 51 to 100 foot buffer zones, which while not restoring it to its original state should over time allow uh, repopulation of plant life in the area and should stabilize the ground through the addition of seed mixes. Um, it, it struck us as being significant progress on the site not complete restoration to the original state, which isn't necessarily possible, but getting it closer to what it was. Any other comments from the board? Mr. Richardson. Yeah, one of the things I, I want to ask about is the letter that we got from uh, Ms. Fernald and her explanation of um, What's in the uh, what's in the report that I'm I'm trying to remember specifically here without having it directly in front of me, but her explanation of what she felt was the history uh, that wasn't true that as it was mentioned, and is there a way of having that corrected in in the, in the uh, report or at least amended that her letter could go in that? Director Mears. The planning board put, could put a condition uh, for a plan revision that the report be updated. I would. I don't know if like there's a way that. to verify that, but uh, ver verification. And if it is true, uh, I mean, I would take her word for it. She's been involved in this for quite a while, uh, but I would like to see that as an amendment to the report. Mr. Rhodes. Uh, to address that item, we did speak about that on Conservation Commission as well. Um, unfortunately, we can't go back with aerial photo evidence to the time that she references. The earliest photo evidence, I believe, was 1968 or 1969, late 1960s, and that did indicate a pond on the site at that point in time. Mr. Belmore. Yeah, um, other than it being a piece of information, I don't know what useful purpose it serves for the restoration plan. So that would be my, uh, I don't know why we would, uh, I appreciate the thought, but the, the uh, her email will be a part of the record um, if anybody does research. Uh, it, unless it, in, it enhanced the restoration plan in some capacity or affected the restoration plan, I don't, uh, you know, I, I fail to see the rational nexus to go to that degree of trying to validate it, and I appreciate Jeremy's uh, input that they addressed it also at the Conservation Commission yeah. level. Uh, Mr. Witham. So a couple of questions. Um, first, for Director Mears, um, both in the staff memo and in the wetland restoration report, it talks about uh, the ongoing monitoring and sort of just monitoring that what's supposed to get done gets done and that what gets done survives, right? So um, who does that? It, it, it references like taking photos, sending it to New Hampshire DES. Is that done by city staff? Is it done by the applicant's attorney? Uh, who, who, who does this? I would ask that it be done by the applicant and then the city staff could verify that it's been completed. Am I allowed to comment on the, on the question? Yes. Thank you. It is envisioned that the wetland scientist would be crafting these re monitoring reports first after the installation of the vegetation 
and then June 30th of year one, June 30th of year two. That's for the vegetation, and then there's also the invasive aquatic species. I appreciate that response, and if I had to pick somebody, that's probably the best pick, right? Because he designed the plan, is going to be able to easily recognize whether or not it's done correctly and the right species and all of that. So I do appreciate that response, and maybe we could memorialize that within our, our materials. That that seems to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Richardson. Uh, yeah, I, just to go back to that, oh, I mean, the, sorry. the sorry. comment that, okay. The, the comment that was made by Mark Jacobs also was not verified. So I just want to see that there's a, a differing opinion. If there were no photographs, then how could Mr. Jacobs make that other than the, on the basis of, make that comment and let, uh, other than the basis of what someone told him? So this is just another version. This has a whole history of not following recommendations. And so at least to add something into that record that is contrary to his suggestion that uh, uh, the uh, that that roadway was was put in by these people, and you know that just that just makes sense to me. That's all. Follow up, and Mr. Witham, finish your uh, thought. All right. I, this is a question for for Ms. Brown. Uh, is the applicant planning to do this work himself, or is he going to sub this out? Or we don't know that yet. We don't, we don't know if it's going to need to be subbed out. I mean, I have um, landscaper, you know, like um, small one-person operations that would be cost-effective that I have given to names to him. Mark uh, Jacobs will be on site, and we are hoping to have a city staff member on site when Mr. Davis is operating the excavator to save cost. So he's doing some of the work himself, under supervision, if I can speak to uh, the 30-foot roadway, uh, that is a dispute of fact um, between the letter and the report. I looked at LIDAR images to confirm some of the facts that were e represented by Mr. Davis before they were put into the report. So I felt satisfied that there was enough visual data to, to substantiate that there was a road there. And I went back on there were the LIDARs that are on the granite system, and then we also were pulling up historical uh, Google Earth. You can go back an, a number of years. Mr. Beaumont and then Mr. Richardson. Um, I don't know if the uh, applicant's representative just talked about that. I, I, I guess I don't want to sound um, a tit for tat or back and forth with Mark. Um, it's just it's it's his report. He, I, we can't change his report. Um, we have the we have the email as contrary information. If we want to hire an expert, it'll cost the city money to try to go back and research. Unless it's going to affect the restoration plan, and the conservation commission didn't think it did, otherwise they would afford that recommendation to us. I hate to assume, but I'll I'll, I'll draw that that. Uh, uh, nexus to it that they would have asked us to or asked the applicant come back to them with with more verification and and uh, in regards to that uh, path and road or whatever it is so um i don't know i'm um i'm good with where we're at um i like the condition that uh uh council with mentioned about making that a, a condition another condition of approval that uh, it'd be monitored by uh, and reported by Chris uh, Jacobs, the wetland scientist that the, uh, I guess he's a, a wetland scientist and a soil scientist uh, that they uh, provide those reports uh, as noted by the applicant's representative and that they be sent to the uh, uh, Department of Development Services, the planning office for the director's review and staff's review uh, at code. And I like the notion of um, whether we make it a condition, maybe make it a condition of approval that when work is conducted, that the applicant uh, has their soil scientist aboard and invites the appropriate city official to also participate in overseeing that work. And maybe that can be a condition of approval also if the applicant's amenable to it. And uh, I think pending further discussion, I'm, I'm, I think this again, to, not to be redundant, but it will, it's a good step in the right direction. Mr. Richardson.
Thank you. Um, I'm very familiar with LIDAR and I'm very familiar with Google Earth and all that. It doesn't go back to 1958. He's making an accusation or he's making a comment about people who owned the property from 1944 to 1958 when those things did not exist. And so all I'm saying is that I believe that when a statement is made that is contested, as you say, Ms. Brown, um, the other side ought to be part of that record. And that's all I'm saying. And, and I don't see what the big deal is to just add it to, you know, make sure that it's in the record and on file there for everybody to see. This is a person who hasn't complied in how many years? And, the, you know, the other side ought to be heard in the record. That's all I'm saying. I have one question. Of, uh, I don't know if anybody has answered Ms. Kareen's uh, concern as far as how much information she is required to get in this process? Or? So she was notified by certified mail. Uh, for conditional use permits, uh, they are not notified for the Conservation Commission meeting, only the Planning Board as required by state statute. Okay, so as far as the information, to how, it, how it ends up affecting her part of the pond, what, where, where would that come from? So we did put a condition of approval that uh, Sorry, hold on a minute. Uh, revisions to the plan in New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services comments and revisions shall be incorporated into the final wetlands restoration plan. So they still need to submit a restoration plan to uh, New Hampshire DES as part of this project. Okay, thank you. Mr. Witham. Thank you. Uh, just to the two sort of ads or amendments with regard to the conditions uh, about uh, we talked about Mark Jacobs doing it but I'd be better suited I think just to say a certified wetland and soil scientist licensed in the state of New Hampshire that way if Mr. Jacobs is not available or the applicant changes or anything else that we can still move forward right so just eliminating the name and just having uh, a title position, if you will. But other than that, I'd like, as Mr. Belmore stated. Any further questions to the board? Mr. Rhodes. I uh, just wanted to get on the record a couple of items. Uh, one is regarding Conservation Commission looking at the, the history and the two statements made. Um, we did not dig deeper into that than looking at what was available for photographic evidence there and uh, evaluated the, the plan. Um, rather than digging into the history of the site there in more detail. Um, I also wanted to take a, a moment and thank Ms. Green for pursuing these items over the years. Uh, I think reading into the history of the site and what's gone on there, uh, there's been substantial involvement by neighbors, the city, the state, now the court system to get us to this point. Um, it sounds like you've been a substantial part of that involvement and in pushing to get this restoration underway. So I wanted to publicly acknowledge that. Thank you. Any other questions to the board? The direct may I like to review conditions of the uh, CUP motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Plan revisions revise the wetlands restoration plan to include the following revisions. 7.2 invasive species New Hampshire DES recommendations of control of invasive species found in the restored wetland areas during restoration shall be completed. Uh, 7.5 long-term monitoring and status reports to include the City of Summersworth uh, Department of Development Services which I just added in the distribution of status reports. New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services comments and revisions shall be incorporated into the final wetlands restoration plan. Conditions that must be met prior to final approval. The final plan shall bear the stamp and signature of a licensed land surveyor and final wetland restoration plan shall bear the stamp and signature of a licensed wetland scientist. Federal and state permits, all federal and state permits shall be in place before signing and recording, including New Hampshire DES wetlands permit. 
conditions applicable during and after constructions for all projects approved under the conditional use permits signs shall be in place at the end of the vegetated buffer. Those signs shall be provided by the city at the cost of the applicant, uh, showing that there is a buffer there. Monitoring and removal of aquatic species within the pond based on recommendations by New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Any fallen woody debris within the wetland within the pond shall remain and not be removed unless a conditional use permit is applied for. Regular monitoring for two years in compliance with any outcomes of monitoring reports results as indicated in the restoration plan shall be submitted by a certified wetland scientist. Uh, future proposed development structures, uses, activities and disturbances and changes in use within the wetlands buffer shall require a conditional use permit as described in Chapter 19, Section 13, Riparian and Wetland Buffer District Ordinance. It should be noted that there may be intermittent streams located outside of the property boundaries, but the wetlands buffer would impact the subject property and should be delineated prior to any future work. Duration of approval, all conditions of approval shall be valid for 120 days in which time all precedent conditions must be met uh, or the approval shall be null and void. The applicant may request an extension no later than 14 days prior to the expiration. Extension, all requests for extension must be submitted in writing to the Department of Development Services no later than 14 days prior to the expiration within appropriate fees, failure to comply with the deadline, dates without submission of a written request for extension will result in the approval being null and void. Thank you, Director Mears. May Mr. Witham. You captured the certified wetland soil scientist license in New Hampshire in 3D. However, we talked about having that sort of position on site during the actual restoration effort as well when equipment is being operated. So you might be able to wordsmith it into 3D or add a 3F to capture that. And also add in, please add in uh, uh, certified in New Hampshire. I don't think you that just said good. certified soil scientist, but state of New Hampshire certified soil scientist. Yes. I think there's a way to uh, put a condition that section 7.3 of general construction sequence shall be followed, uh, which arrange pre-construction meeting on site with the owner, contractor, wetland scientist, Summersworth Department of Development Services and their agents, New Hampshire DES staff to review plans, the restoration report and New Hampshire DES approval. Notify the Summersworth Department of Development Services in New Hampshire DES 48 hours prior to commencing restoration work. Install and inspect perimeter uh, sit, uh, siltation controls prior to commencing work. Remove fill commencing at the culvert wetland upland boundary at the north end of the property and working within the south towards the pond. Restoration construction activities and fill shall be monitored by a certified wetland scientist certified in the state of New Hampshire. Install additional sil siltation barriers as specified by the wetland scientist certified in the state of New Hampshire. Appropriate seed and mulch with clean straw. Install specific tree and shrub plantings. Uh, contract with wetland scientist Summersworth uh, Development Services Department in New Hampshire DS regarding any long delays or the need for su substitutions in plant material. I think we should just refer back to this report. Everything you just, oh, that's in the report. Yes. Got it. All right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow a condition. <laughs> so we should just report, uh, refer to that section of the report. I just wanted to read this report out loud I, for the I public. I think that's fine if, as long as we refer it. And then maybe we could do that as a 3F or anywhere is in there. And prepare and submit initial status report to Department of Development Services in New Hampshire DES. This time I'll entertain a CUP intent. motion. But I had a question. Question by Mr. Belmore beforehand. Uh, how much jurisdiction does the DES have? Because they've, they've come and gone over the time. It's been the city that's been the driver of this, from my perspective at least. For any of the filling that happened within the wetlands, that's the part that New Hampshire DES has jurisdiction over. The zero to 50 foot buffer is local land use regulations. 
and 50 to 100 foot. Any further questions? If not, I'll entertain a CUP motion. Mr. Rhodes. I move the request of Michael Davis for a conditional use permit for after the fact excavation alterations within the riparian and wetland buffer located on a property at 25 Otis Road be approved with the conditions as laid out by uh, Ms. Mears. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes, second by Mr. Obitis. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? CUP motion is approved. Item C, Michael Davis is seeking a conditional use permit for tree removal, tree removal within the riparian and wetland buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road in the residential single family R1 district. This is map 31, lot 46, CUP number 072023. Director Mayors. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The applicant is requesting to remove 10 pine trees located within the wetland buffer of the existing pond on site. Uh, this did go to the Conservation Commission. For recommendation, the Conservation Commission reviewed the request at the July 10th meeting and made the following recommendations. Recommend the approval of tree removal within the 51 to 100 foot buffer with the requirement that the tree stumps remain in place. And two, recommend denial of the request to remove trees within the zero to 50 foot buffer. The, conser the Conservation Commission felt that there was no, not a hardship to remove uh, the trees from the zero to 50 foot buffer and expressed concerns of negative impact of removing those trees could have due to the potential that without the trees there would be less shade and chance of increased water temperatures uh, allowing for allergy blooms at the pond. Staff recommends that the board accept this application as complete and begin the review process. Thank you, Director Mears. Entertain a motion to accept the application. Motion, uh, Mr. Rhodes, sorry. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes. Second. Second by Mr. Robitis. Discussion. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The application is approved. Motion that this has uh, no regional impact. A motion, right. motion made by Mr. Belmore that for regional impact. Second by Mr. Witham. Any discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? The motion passes. This time I'd like to invite Ms. Brown to make the presentation on this item. I've, I'll reintroduce myself, Marsha Brown with NH Brown Law, representing Michael uh, Davis in this matter. This conditional use permit uh, started out with a uh, request to remove 10 trees. Upon surveying them with their location within the 50, 0 to 50 foot buffer and 50 foot to 100 foot buffer, um, determined that there were two that were within the 50 to 100. The rest of them were within the 50. So at the con with the Conservation Commission um, uh, condition uh, and recommendation that none be cut within the zero to 50, uh, we're not, Mike, Mr. Davis is not appealing that and just requesting that um, he be allowed to cut whatever he can cut outside of that 50 foot and that, that is the two, two large pine trees within the 50 to 100. Okay, thank you. This time I open public hearing. Anybody care to comment on this item? Ms. Kareen? Just restate your name and address for the record. Microphone there. I'm getting a cue from our. Uh, uh, Is that green light on? So much. I may have turned it off. My That's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I, I'm familiar with the trees because they've been banded in preparation. Um, the only questions I have that I'm not clear about 
um, if those trees are cut, are they going to be allowed to fall naturally down? Because once they do, we're talking about things that remind me of king pines. They're 100 feet, 55, 75 feet tall. And they're not that far outside the buffer. So if they're going to just be dropped, they're going to fall in, in the pond. So my question is, are they going to be removed? What's the purpose of cutting them down if they're just going to fall there? Um, and I'm not really sure um, why they need to, to go. If there's no damage, I mean, if, if they're not going to lay in the pond, if they're there for, so that there can be more um, environment for wildlife, I've already got seven trees in the pond that the pond is just coming back. I no turtles, but I've, I hear some bullfrogs. Um, so that's my question, and I don't know, Mr. Rhodes, I don't know if you can answer, but I can't hear you when you speak. I'm sorry, I'm very hard of hearing. And that's really my only concern. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else care to comment on this application? Ma'am? Good evening. My name is Holly Fazzino. I live at 10 Otis Road and I also own 8 Otis Road. I wish to express my concern about the wildlife. There are a lot of uh, animals that pass on the game trail from his property through my property and other neighbors' property, including deer, fox, bobcat, turkeys, and other animals that I have not yet seen and I am concerned about their habitat. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment on the application? Director Mears, is there any correspondence concerning this application? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and turn the questions from the board. Mr. Rhodes. Uh, to address Ms. Kareens, and I, I apologize if uh, you have difficulty hearing me, um, question about the intent of removing these trees. Um, <coughs> Mr. Davis's attorney had stated at the uh, Conservation Commission uh, hearing that the justification for removing them was that Mr. Davis, to quote, doesn't like pines. Um, and his intent was to sell the lumber uh, from these trees that were dropped in an effort to potentially defray some of the cost of uh, the restoration plan. I did also want to do something highly unusual, and that's argue against my statement from a week ago. Um, at the time that we discussed permitting removal of those two trees inside the 50 to 100 foot buffer, I don't think any of us were aware of the potential for it creating an additional CUP request if those were to happen to fall into the pond. Given the obviously higher priority of the restoration plan and the risk of delay if this were permitted to uh, take place before that restoration plan were completed, I would now argue against uh, granting this CUP and permitting a potential delay in the restoration plan to go forward. Thank you. Mr. Horton. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of granting the conditional use permit for the removal of additional trees. Uh, I'd like to see a good faith effort put forward um, by the restoration efforts already approved. So uh, at that, this time, I'm not in favor of approving an additional condition use permit. Mr. Witham. Thank you. Yeah, I am a hard no on this. I was a hard no before I walked in, and my no is now bold face in capital letters. Uh, no. Uh, I, this goes in the category, if you give an inch, they'll take a foot. I, I, I have no confidence that just the number of trees that are banded would be cut. We're, we're going to take it further than that, uh, and I'm concerned about that. I don't know what the net gain of this endeavor would be. Maybe there's a bit of finances to sell the wood, but that, that's not my concern here. Uh, my concern is restoration of the property, and this doesn't move the ball at all in that direction. So, yeah, this is a no for me. Any other comments from the board? Mr. Rhodes. 
I move that the request of Michael Davis for a conditional use permit for tree removal within the repairing a wetland buffer on a property located at 25 Otis Road be denied for the following reasons. Potential a creation of a delay in uh, completion of the restoration plan due to additional need for a CUP, lack of ex exhibition of hardship. I believe those will be the two. Motion made by Mr. Rhodes. Second. Second by Mr. Witham. Discussion. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Opposed? The motion passes. The item is denied. Next item D, Inflection Point Investments LLC is seeking minor subdivision approval to construct a three lot subdivision and to convert the existing three unit building into a condominium at 73 Noble Street in residential single family A with historic overlay R1AH district. Assessors map 13, lot 11, sub number 03 2024, HDC number 28 2024. Director Mears, do you have anything to add? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The applicant is requesting to sub subdivide the existing 1.02 acre parcel into three lots. There is an existing three unit structure uh, that is being uh, requested to be converted into three condo units. Applicant has received historic district approval back in June to re relocate the stone rota retaining wall to create a larger parking area for the condo units. If the applicant changes, reconfigures, expands the parking area. This will require a minor site plan or a site plan uh, for 73 Noble Street. This application is uh, complete and uh, the board uh, should accept it as complete and begin the review process. Contain a motion for application acceptance. Motion made by Mr. Rubitis, seconded by Mr. Witham. Discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Application is accepted. This time I'd like to invite the representatives of 73 Noble Street to make their presentation. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to start uh, briefly. My name is Tyler Allen. Uh, I'm a member and the manager of the LLC. I um, just wanted to thank everybody for their time in reviewing this matter, and uh, we, we really look forward to getting this done and adding some quality housing. If you want to tip your mic up a little bit, please. There yeah, is that better? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin McEnany. I'm the uh, representative uh, and the surveyor of, of record on the property. So what we have before you tonight is uh, a few things happening all, all at one time. The first thing is a minor subdivision, a three-lot subdivision, um, this, this lot has frontage on both Noble Street and on Emory Street. And there's an existing three-unit building that frontage, has frontage on Noble Street. Uh, the other two lots that will be created will actually have access off of Emory Street. So that's one item that we're asking for. The second is, a, um, is a, uh, an approval of the conversion of the three units in the existing building to become condominiums so they can be sold individually. And as part of this whole project, um, there's a, a, a stone retaining wall in the straight line right behind the existing building that to accommodate the parking for the three unit so that we can meet the requirements, we actually exceed the requirements required by the city. But we're going to relocate that to the new property line that we're gonna create kind of behind or to the side of the three unit. Um, that way it'll provide access to be behind that and allow for the parking to take place. The reconstruction of that wall, which is basically a large flat slab cut granite wall, very attractive. Um, the material that's already in the, on, in, on place, on site, will be reused. And if there's any additional material that will be required, they're going to recreate and use the exact same type of material. I can tell you that we've been before the Historic District Commission and um, we received an approval for the re 
the relocation of the wall. That was the only thing that w was in question for the Historic District Commission. There's no changes to the outside of the building. Um, if there's anything, if there are building permits that are going to be taking place on the vacant lots, we will go back to the Historic District Commission with review of plans and the applications at that point. Um, the, all three lots are serviced by municipal, municipal sewer and water. We've been to the TRC, received a number of comments, and we've addressed all those. I think you'll see by the conditions of approval uh, from the staff that those are pretty standard conditions of approval, nothing out of the ordinary. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hey, thank you. Sam, I'd like to open public hearing. Anybody care to comment on this application? I thought it, thought it might be correct to model my attire after Mr. Richardson, but I, all I could get was black and white documentation. I picked the wrong end of the spectrum, apparently. <laughs> my name is Mike Creek, and I live at 79 Noble. It's the property that abuts the 73 Noble property on its western border. And the only concern I have is that uh, in the last few years, there's been an accumulation of brush, uh, panel of uh, fiberboard, and a lawn tractor sitting about 15 feet from my property line. It's anybody in those buildings or even on that lot cannot see it. There's a, sh I guess I'll move on. There's a small shed behind the house, which is right here. And this debris, uh, there's brush, branches, limbs, uh, a lawn tractor, and some other things. I took a couple of pictures which I sent to Mr. Allen this morning. I only sent him his email this morning because I only found out about the meeting on Monday. I can pass these around. This was taken from my driveway this morning. I took some pictures yesterday, but they weren't of any decent quality. So this morning I went down to get the paper, and with the sun shining in the background, I was able to get a de two decent shots. So I just wanted, I'd like to make it conditional that all that debris be removed so that I'm not looking at this eyesore forever. And some of it may go back to the previous owners. I don't know when the property changed hands. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Uh, sorry. Mr. Allen did get back to me by email today and said he might have it even picked up this afternoon, but it wasn't there by this evening. I'm, that's asking a bit much. Okay. I'm sure he's honest uh, and intends to have it taken out, but I just want to make sure I don't, I'm not left holding the junk. The tractor presents a danger to my well. I'm probably the last person on the hill that's taking water out of a well, but the, the tractor has been there for several years. It's, eventually, it's going to leak transmission fluid, oil, coolant, and it, it's about 25 yards from my well. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Good evening, Mr. Chairman and me members of the board. My name is Dan Brown. I live on the adjacent property of 18 Emory Street, ac across the street from the proposed subdivision. The first issue I want to address is this notice, where it says uh, a uh, the LLC is seeking minor subdivision approval. Well, to me, it's not minor. It's it's across the street from me, so I think that's a mischaracterization. <clears throat> okay. Secondly, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself because I know that a lot of this has to go in front of the historical committee, committee but I want to know what type of homes are, gonna, are being planned to be constructed, precise locations, and will these plans be subjected to the same scrutiny as I was, <clears throat> where I was unneedlessly required to appear on four separate occasions in front of the historic committee to reach approval for my home after my home burned in 2016? My third concern is uh, how long will this construction of these two proposed homes last because this will definitely affect the valuation of my home. I've 
I believe, should I decide to put it on, on the market. My next concern is uh, in cons in concerning the three condos that are uh, proposed. Uh, to what extent will construction be done? Over what time frame? And uh, is this building really compatible for three condos? Uh, last year, over the past year, there's Servpro has been over there about a month and uh, plumbers, and uh, I guess this is due to a toilet that just about came through the second floor, according to one of the t tenants, as relayed to me. So I'm just concerned about that. Uh, I want to make sure that all planned construction goes before the Historical Committee. And then there's a inconsistency where this notice says a three lot subdivision and to convert the existing it says and to convert the existing three unit building so it's, in other words it says divide this property into three lots and then convert the con the existing building into condos so that's a discrepancy as, as far as i'm concerned That's basically it. But at this time, uh, in light of w my questions, I'd like to voice my ob objection to this plan, plan subdivision. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Sir? Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrew Butler. I'm here on. You can move it up yep. if you want. There we go. Uh, good evening. My name is Andrew Butler. Um, I'm here on behalf of my uh, father-in-law at 89 Prospect Street, Mark Bernier. Um, I am. I have several concerns uh, about the planned subdivision. Um, first and foremost, um, although the subdivision lots meet the minimum dimensional requirements of 10,000 square feet per new lot. Um, I believe the intent of the dimensional standards and density requirements are not being met. The existing lot is approximately 45,000 square feet um, giving a, with three units on it, giving a density of one unit per, per 15,000 square feet with the addition of two single family homes. That would bring the density per uh, uh, residential unit down to 9,000 uh, square feet per unit. Um, which is below the requirements for the R1A um, zoning district that these properties reside in. Secondly, the lot number three, although having frontage totaling greater than 100 feet on uh, Noble Street, I believe the applicant suggested that the uh, address and driveway would be on Emory Street, which w only has a frontage of, of approximately 79 feet. Um, question for the applicant is that um, looking at the condo site plan moving the retaining wall to increase the parking area it would appear that the driveway would be expanded um, and be, be paved further to me this is an increase in the impervious area on the lot and should be subject to a stormwater management plan um, and one further uh, mention of the retaining wall um, with the retaining wall being moved further into the hill um, I am not sure whether or not the uh, there's been a grading plan done to determine if the retaining wall is going to be greater than four feet at which point I believe the retaining wall would need to be um, designed and stamped by a structural engineer um, and lastly I would like to echo the previous speaker Dan Brown and mention that any proposed homes um, on the lot should be subject to historical district standards as this is part of the historical overlay district. Um, all homes should meet the character of the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else care to speak? Uh, comment on this application? Is there any correspondence, Director Mears? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Seeing none. 
turn to questions from the board. Mr. Chairman, can I address some of the issues that were Bottom out there? from the applicant? Yes. Um, so the first one uh, uh, with the abutter at 79 Noble, uh, certainly that trash is going to be cleaned up and will be shortly as, as uh, Tyler has indicated in his email back to the abutter. Um, so the the matter of the trash was brought to my attention and within 20 minutes today I did respond to Mr. Cregan uh, and I've hired uh, a local business New England Pickers uh, they thought they would make it today but they have said hopefully they will be there tomorrow to uh, address those items they're gonna pick up the particle board the lawn mower uh, the tenants had some other items outside the building I was not aware of I've asked them to move them out of Mr. Cregan's line of sight uh, I believe that has already happened so we're trying to be a good neighbor here. We want to work with everybody, um, and, and that's really the intent of what we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you. With regard to uh, Mr. Brown's comments, um, uh, the fact that it's called a minor subdivision is basically a town or a city uh, definition of a certain number of lots. If it's under four, under four lots, it's considered a minor subdivision. Uh, we have already received HDC approval for the removal or the re relocation of the wall and one of their conditions was that we return which we know we would have to with a review of the plans certainly the plans are intended to fit in with the historic district I can tell you that the LLC is unsure whether or not they're going to actually sell those lots or build on them but either way we'll have to go back to the HTC no matter no matter how that happens uh, time frame of construction don't don't even know because we don't know when it's going to happen um, with regard to Mr. Butler's comments, um, as far as the density goes, the only density that's addressed in the zoning issue in that zone is the fact that the lot size has to be a minimum of 10,000 square feet with 100 feet of frontage. There are, because there are no multi-units allowed, the three unit is grandfathered. So there's no way to calculate a density, and Michelle, you correct me if I'm wrong, the density that's listed in the zoning strictly is lot sizing and not density with regard to per unit density. So the grandfathering of the three unit, I think, goes along with as long as it's on a 10,000 square foot lot or larger. Um, the minimum frontage, we, the requirement is for minimum frontage on one of the streets. We are uh, providing that on um, uh, Noble Street on one of the lots, but the access is actually going to be off Emory Street, which is allowed by the city. We've had discussion with the engineering department, uh, as well as community services, and we understand that we have to go back and get driveway permits and all those other utility permits uh, along the way once the building permits are applied for. Um, as far as the, uh, including the impervious and a, a drainage uh, plan, That was one of the comments of the TRC which that we provided an erosion and sedimentation control uh, plan, which is what that is right there. So we have the proper siltation devices in, in place during the construction. Um, there will be additional impervious, uh, and we were asked to uh, provide that calculation, which is on this plan. So I think that met the requirements of the TRC. Uh, with regard to the retaining wall and the height of it, it's currently between three and a half to four feet. The intention is to keep it exactly that same height, just move it back about 10 feet so that we can provide for the access to the back of the, of the property. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, questions from the board? Mr. Belmo? So when you move the retaining wall back, is there any issue with uh, a change in grade and the need for any structural uh, engineering stamping or anything like that? No, not at all. It's it's basically the same grade. It's flat on top. We're going to move it back 12 feet, 10 to 12 feet, and it's going to stay almost identical grade. Mr. Witham. Thank you. I do appreciate the comments made by the abutters. Uh, this is a, a, a potential uh, change to their neighborhood. I, I think initially, other than the expansion of the parking area for the three condo units and the moving of the wall, it, it might not look different at all um, until those other two lots are, are potentially developed down the road. 
uh, either by your applicant or if they sell those lots as individual home lots. But I can appreciate that the neighborhood will change. Uh, that being said, uh, it's allowed by our zoning ordinance. Uh, it appears by all uh, description that it meets the zoning ordinance. Uh, a building permit could not be issued unless it met the zoning ordinance unless they sought relief, not from this board, but from the Zoning Board of Adjustment, but it doesn't sound like that relief is needed. Uh, it is in the historic overlay district, as has been enumerated several times here tonight. Uh, and although I can't speak for the historic district commission, I don't sit on that commission. I have watched their meetings. I, I watched all of the city meetings. Um, recent houses that have been built on Noble Street across from the ball field, and then there's, a, there's one on Mount, uh, Vernon Street right behind that's under construction right now. I can tell you that HDC is very happy with uh, elements of the construction of those homes. Uh, the big overhangs, the wide corner boards, and elements of that nature. So just knowing what they've looked for with those uh, properties, I suspect they would look for with, with these properties um, uh, most certainly. Um, so there is a a process in place and there is a vetting process and uh, those HDC meetings are public as well so if we ever got to a point where there's additional homes constructed and the abutters wanted to, to weigh in there are opportunities there along the way also so um, those are my comments thank you mm -hmm. uh, comments from the board entertain a regional impact motion Motion is no regional impact. Motion made by Mr. Belmore, seconded by Mr. Richardson. Discussion? Those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? At this time, uh, Director Mears, would you like to review the conditions of approval? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chan Chairman. Plan revisions, Matt, law ID shall be according to the assessment assignment provided by the city assessor, conditions that must be met prior to the final approval. The final plan shall bear the stamp and signature of a licensed land surveyor. Um, please provide a PDF copy of the final recorded plans for tax map updates. Monumentation granite bound shall be installed at all intersections of lot lines and street rights of way, as well as property corners which do not abut the public right of way per subdivision regulation. A surveyor is to submit a signed letter to the, the planning department stating that the new lot corner monuments have been set prior to recording of the subdivision and condo plan. Applicant shall provide draft condominium association documentation. This document should include language of maintenance of the retaining wall. This shall be required to be reviewed by the city's attorney and escrow shall be collected in the amount of $750 or as determined by the director of planning and community development to cover the cost of review. Conditions to be completed prior to the start of site work. All service connections from the utility overhead line shall be installed underground. The applicant shall apply for a new water and sewer connection permit. The applicant will be re required to pay standard water and sewer connection fees on new properties connecting to the water and sewer system. The development will be required new addresses. Please submit a request for new address to the city engineer. If a hearing before the E911 committee is required, this hearing must occur prior to the issuance of building permit. Per section 1923E9, the building shall display the designated address number in such a manner to be visible. The applicant shall obtain all applicable permits through the Department of Public Works. This shall include, but not limited to, driveway permit, trans permit. Residential driveways widths can be no wider than 22 feet. Erosion control is required to be installed prior to the start of site work. Erosion control shall be uh, properly maintained throughout construction. Any breaks or breaches shall be repaired within 48 hours. Conditions applicable during and after construction. All new subdivision lots shall be required to have a foundation certification, certification survey prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy. If during construction the existing curb or roadways are damaged, the lot owner will be required to repair and replace in kind to the satisfaction of the Director of Public Works and Utilities. This lot is located within the historic district. A certificate of appropriateness is required for any construction, exterior alterations, modification, repairs, relocations, or demolishes outlined in Chapter 19, Section 4 of the historic district. 
That's it. Thank you. At this time, I'll entertain a subdivision motion. Mr. Horton. Move that the request of Inflection Point Investment LLC for the three lot subdivision and to convert the existing three unit building into a condominium at 73 Noble Street be approved with the conditions outlined in the director's memo. Motion made by Mr. Horton, seconded by Mr. Barry. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Oppose? Subdivision is approved. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Mayers, any new business that may come before the board? None this evening, Mr. Chairman. Any workshop business? None this evening. Communications and mis miscellaneous. Stay tuned for uh, uh, an invitation from the Sports Hub regarding uh, inflation of the dome. Oh, exciting. <laughs> Entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion made by Mr. Robitis. Second. Second by Mr. Witham. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed? Thank you very much. Opposed. 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 He's going to pull out his trundle bed in his office. <laughs>